Uh, last week marked 31 weeks in the Gospel of Matthew. How many didn't know it was going to take that long? <laughs> and uh, it's not because we're slow, it's just because that Gospel is so rich. We're actually taking a two-week break, and the Gospel of Matthew will pick it back up. And this is uh, not because we got bored or tired. Uh, it's actually because we're entering into a season where this information could be super helpful to you. As you head into the more summer-like months, our schedules often become more relaxed. The kinds of people that we hang around is slightly different. The kinds of things we can join in with or participate in alters because our schedule is a little bit different. And so what I want to do is to take a couple weeks to talk about how we can share our faith in any environment. And even when I say that, I know that there are some people who get a little bit uh, uh, intimidated or maybe even experience some anxiety. And you go, well, I'm not a preacher. And the good news is you don't have to be a preacher. The good news also is, is that God's grace has made a difference in your life. And there are actually wonderful ways to share that that you would be surprised how interested people are in them. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Jesus tells us that it's, it's good for us to trust in what he has done for us. He also tells us it's good to share with other people what he has done for us. And maybe you go, yeah, pastor, I'm not a sharer. That's not me. But that's probably not true. For example, if, if you are a tech-savvy person and you discover a new app for your smart device that you really like, do you not tell anyone about that? Uh, you probably tell someone. Or how about you come across a new music group or an artist that you really like? Do you not tell anybody about that? If you find a restaurant where the service is outstanding and the food is delicious and the prices are reasonable, how many like to know where that place is? Like the, we'd like to find that out. And we, we naturally tell that. If, if we come across an Instagram feed that we find interesting or funny, we'll, we'll absolutely share that. If we try a diet and it actually works. Isn't that the kind of thing you, you tell other people about? And, and, or maybe a, a training regimen, something that's getting you in better shape. We naturally share all of these things. But when it comes to our faith, we tend to go one in two directions. And the first direction is we just go silent. We really don't have much to say on it because, first of all, it feels like a very personal thing to us. But secondly, we have a sense that people can get frustrated when we start telling them anything about God or Scripture or faith. And, and so we, we worry that we're actually going to push people away uh, by sharing anything of our faith. So some people go silent. Some people get loud. Like once they find faith, there isn't anybody that isn't going to know about it. And so they, they, they've made a decision. They want everybody to know about it. And here's the challenge is that these responses, it's very easy to say, well, those responses are caused by religion and how you practice it. Like if you have a more reflective approach to spirituality, maybe you're not as outgoing and sharing. If you, if you have a more charismatic environment for worship, maybe you are more... It, it actually has less to do with the actual style of worship. It really has more to do with our personalities. And there's a couple things that are true about us. Uh, let's just check and see, all right? This is an honesty test right now, and Jesus is watching. How many like to be right? There's just some things that feels, it feels so good to be right. And so sometimes in sharing our faith, we just want to be right, which means that a lot of our faith sharing can sound like a debate or an argument. And we go into prosecutorial attack mode. And we think that we can bring someone into the kingdom of God by arguing them there. We're, we're less like shepherds that people follow and a little bit more like sheepdogs where we're threatening to bite and get the sheep to run, hopefully in the right direction. And so, the, so we like to be right. And then there's, there's other people that like to be liked. 
We just want people to think well of us. We want them to stay close to us. We, we don't want to rock any boats that would make someone feel uncomfortable around us. And, and in that environment, we can be more about seeking people's approval than anything else. And that basically requires you to disappear a lot. Uh, you kind of fade into the background and you hope that people will just accept you for not being something they don't like. And uh, that's not the best approaches, going loud or, or going silent are not the best approaches. What if there really was another option to faith sharing? What if you, we aren't called to dominate the opinions of others and, and wrestle them into the grace of God? And what if we're not called to disappear? What if we're actually called to, I think if you've been around church world very long, you'll recognize this. What if we've been called to make disciples? Not dominating not disappearing, but disciple making. In 1 Peter, the third chapter, it tells us this, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. But do this with gentleness and respect. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. A better option to trying to prove that we are right is to be eager to do good. Peter tells us this whole context is about how we share and live out our faith. But he starts with this idea, be eager to do good. He doesn't say, make sure you are always right. Be eager to do good. When we're, when we're trying to be right all the time, we can be a little bit on the aggressive side. When we're trying to blend into the background, we can be on the absent side. But that's not what actually helps attract people to the grace of God. There's a world of difference between intimidation and invitations. And we've all experienced both. And there's one we always prefer. So what does he say? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. This is a very different way of thinking about suffering. When I think about suffering, do you know what my number one prayer is? To avoid it. Please God, I don't want to suffer. Whatever path that is, I don't mind going a little further. You know, how many know on a plane, when there's a storm coming, they'll go around or they'll go over. That, that's how I prefer to live my life. If I could get through life without any suffering at all, I would be okay with that. But that's not a realistic view. So it's common to ask for avoidance and it's common to ask for protection. And such prayers are not wrong, but they are rather limited. And, and Peter tells us that there's actually another thing that can happen in our suffering. And that is that you can be blessed. You can be rewarded because of your suffering. How many here have ever worked out even one time? How many that was enough for you? How many didn't raise your hand because raising your hand feels like a workout and you don't want to do that. It's kind of like that. Yeah. So, so there, there's an expression for people who really push their body to the limit. I'll say the first part. We'll see if you can say the second part. Ready? No pain. No pain. That's right. And then there are some people, it's no pain, no pain. They, they just, they don't want any pain. They'll avoid it at all costs. But Peter says there can be a blessing. There can be a reward that getting through something is kind of like a training thing where there are benefits that come into your life as a result of having gone through that. For Peter, faith is not about achieving a status in which you are invulnerable to any difficulties. For him, it's about being able to get through any difficulty to the place that you actually experience the blessing that is the byproduct of it.
It's a really cool way to think about it. And is do not fear their threats or be frightened. Uh, the obvious way to read that passage is don't be intimidated by other people. But there's another way to interpret it in the Greek. It was kind of curious to me. And what it says is do not fear what they fear. Do not fear what they fear. And he says, don't be frightened. And the word frightened there can mean these words. You ready? Disturbed, agitated, stirred up, or troubled. A lot of agitated people and a lot of stirred up people are actually just afraid. That's kind of what's driving that. And in our world, you've probably noticed, there's more than enough fear to go around. In fact, I think our world is more saturated with fear than almost anything else. And fear shows up in a lot of ways. Fear can show up in, in negativity bias, all right? Let me ask you a question. If somebody gives you a compliment and somebody gives you a criticism, which one are you more likely to remember? If someone gives you five compliments and someone gives you one criticism, which one are you more likely to remember? For some, it doesn't matter how high the compliment number goes. We just have a bias to the, but that was a problem. And fear is actually what's underneath the surface of that. Somehow we're not measuring up or we're not keeping up. Right? So some of us are afraid of loss. We're afraid we'll lose relationships, we'll lose our job, we'll lose our home, we'll lose our health. We'll, there's all kinds of things that we can lose. They actually did an experiment, and it was a flip coin experiment. And the experiment was this. Would you be willing to play this game? We'll flip the coin, and if it's heads, you get $10, and if it's tails, you get to pay $10. Almost no one wants to play that game. You have to make it so that the benefit is almost twice the cost in order to get most people to participate. So it's $20. If I could win 20, I'm willing to risk 10. We're afraid of loss. And we're afraid of missing out. Like something good could happen and I won't be there to enjoy it. And so we cram and jam pack our calendars so there's not any time to reflect, any time to enjoy, any time to relax. We're just in go mode all the time. And we hope that by being as many places as possible, we won't miss out on anything. But fear is what drives that. We're afraid of looking stupid. We don't want to say something or do something where people just kind of give the eye roll and think of how uninformed we are. That's, that's driven by, by fear. Maybe we bought something and paid too much money for it. Maybe we bought the wrong thing and, it, and, and Consumer Reports tells us it's the worst choice you could have made. We're always afraid that we'll make the, the bad bargain, right? And then we're afraid of feeling empty, which is why we fill our houses and our lives with stuff. We've got more stuff than our houses can contain. Some, there's two strategies. Get a bigger house or get storage that you can rent. Pack all the stuff you can't keep in your house in there. We're afraid of being wrong. We're afraid of being in the minority. We're afraid of what someone thinks about us. And this is what Peter tells us. Don't be afraid of what other people are afraid of. And here's the problem. We go, but I am afraid. How can I stop that? That's a good question. And the solution to fear is not to eliminate fear. The solution to fear is to face fear. That's an act of bravery. It, it takes some courage. So do not be disturbed. Do not be agitated. Do not be stirred up. Do not be troubled. But what should we do? Imagine how, you can use your imagination. If I wasn't afraid, what am I likely to do? Do that. Oh, but I'm afraid. You were already afraid. You're just still afraid. But you're on a different path now. Do you see the difference? Then he says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Um, some people think my first name is Pastor and my last name is Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor Bob. And some people think Jesus' first name is Lord, Lord Jesus. That, Lord, that Jesus is really his middle name, and it's Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that's how you, you get to who he is. His name is Jesus, but Lord has to do with the kind of authority that he exercises in our lives. So the question for you is, who's the ultimate authority in your life? Who gets to make the final determination on the decisions that you face? Think about it this way. Whose opinion matters more to you? 
Whose opinion matters more to you? That's a good thing to know. Who are you more concerned about disapproving of you? If they, if they change their opinion, if it would bother you more. Who do you have more respect for? And what Peter says is, if we really want to start making progress on this trying to break free of this concept of fear, is that it's not just about eliminating an emotion. It's about putting someone else in charge of our decisions. And that's Jesus. Because he's the one that can lead us to the fulfilling life. That's what he says in John 10, right? I have come that you might have life to the full. When we make our decisions based on our feelings and our information, we often settle for much less than God intended. And so we don't become brave and we don't become strong and we don't become joyful and we don't become filled with peace because we're operating by a different system. That system is fear. But when we put Jesus in charge of our lives, what we discover is, is that he can guide and direct us to a different set of options than we would have exercised. And that actually takes us to a different place. He goes on to say, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. So he tells us what? Be ready. Be ready for what? Give an answer. Give a reason. But that's actually not the thing to be ready for. That's part of it, but it's incomplete. What's the rest of it? Be ready to respond to everyone who asks. Who asks. That means that we have to hear the questions which means we have to learn to listen, learn to listen. I, I struggle with something called selective hearing. It's a disease that affects males more than females. <laughs> it's not my fault. I was born this way. Uh, I've had lots of people try to help me with this. I've engaged in all kinds of uh, support programs, everything. Uh, I had my ears checked. And uh, turns out I can hear. Just not all the time. <laughs> and this is the thing that happens to us, right? In order to, to live our faith out and in order to attract more people to the grace of God, it actually requires listening first, learning to listen. In fact, this is what we can understand. The key to better responses is listening. You will automatically have a better answer if you just actually listen to the question. What are some things that are true about good listeners? Well, they exercise restraint. What do I mean by that? They don't, they don't go into efficiency mode. I know what you're going to tell me. I know what you're going to ask me. That's going to take you about seven to 17 minutes. I'm going to fix this right now by interrupting you and tell you what you were going to ask me, right? And the problem is, is that, well, there's two problems. One is we often don't know what they were going to ask us. And even if we did get it right, people can't hear our answer because they don't believe we heard their question. And so really good listeners exercise restraint. They, 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 they pause, they're patient. Really good listeners communicate love. People feel rejected when we don't listen to them. So, yeah, but if I keep listening to them, they'll think I'm agreeing with them. That's not the same thing at all. I actually think this. I think we could introduce more people to God by the questions we ask than by the arguments we make. That good listeners ask questions. They ask questions. I was giving a ride to a person one time. I was going somewhere and they, they wanted me to, to take them because they were on the way. And it was, a, it was a fairly long ride. And they knew that I was a pastor, but they didn't have any other option. And so the first thing they said when they got in my car was this. Just so you know, I'm an atheist. Where do you go from that? 
I mean, I could just put the pedal to the floor and aim for a tree and say, we'll see how long you're going to be an atheist. Let's just, <laughs> let's find out how deeply committed to you, to this are you? And, and uh, but that's, that's not good. That's not good. And you only get to do that one time. And then <laughs> I get to heaven and say, yeah, they're, see, they're here. It's not enough, not good. We ask questions. So I, I, I looked at the person and I said, that's really interesting. I said, I kind of know what the process was for me to become a person of faith. Could you tell me what the process was for you to become an atheist? I would love to hear your story. And that changed the entire conversation. What I discovered was is that the reason that they were an atheist is because they lived in a family of atheists. And I said, well, you know, that's okay, but have you ever wondered if, if you should sort through that yourself? Or do you think that you can just depend on them to have the right answers? And they said, well, you know, maybe I should think about it. I said, I've got a couple of books I could recommend to you if you're, if you're interested. They said, I would love that. I sent them the books. They wound up making a commitment to Christ. I'm not, I'm not making this up. Actually, about once or twice a year, they will come back to Rochester, New York, and I will see them hiding out in the congregation. And during worship, their hands are raised. And, and what happened? I didn't argue them into the kingdom. I just asked a question. I wonder how many more people would come to faith in Christ if we asked better questions than just spend all our time trying to come up with better arguments. Uh, good questions don't look for yes or no answers. They actually, you want to hear more than that. And, and then good listeners have, just have better responses. We, we, when we learn to listen like God listens, then we'll learn to be able to say things that God says. This, one of my favorite verses in Proverbs 18 says this, spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. If we're not very good at listening to people, we're probably not very good at listening to God because listening is a skill. Listening is a skill. We need to hear the whispers of God that prompt us, that interrupt our thoughts with the thought we didn't have before, that recommend the course of action that we might not have done all by ourselves. Maybe, maybe God would just whisper to you, spend a few more minutes with this person. Or maybe God would whisper to you, just invite this person over for a cup of coffee. Or maybe God would whisper to you, you could offer prayer to someone. Or, or you, you could, here's something you could do. Actually, our, our church just talked about that very topic. I can send you a link uh, to the message and maybe you would find that helpful. What if God reminded you of, of something in scripture that could actually help in the conversation? There was a very dear lady that was part of our church family, and she had a child that had been killed horribly in an accident, and uh, she was involved in legal actions as a result of that, and she had a, a very impressive attorney. And I'll, I'll, this is one of those things. I don't know how I would handle something like that. And I don't ever want to find out. But somehow... This very precious lady who had experienced the worst possible loss that I can imagine in her conversations over legal matters was concerned about and wanted to help connect this lawyer who was helping her with God. And so she arranged a lunch for the attorney and I to get together. And as it turns out, attorneys are used to having lunches in restaurants that are very different from the restaurants I have lunch in. And I offered to buy. It's the most expensive lunch I've ever paid for in my life, including inflation <laughs> to this day. And, and he knew why I was there because he's a lawyer. And he started going after me about about the Gospels and having different points of views and two witnesses don't ever see the exact same thing. He's just, he's peppering me with questions. And I'm thinking to myself while I'm getting this verbal, uh, 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 well, attack, you know, I'm just thinking to myself, I would not want to be on a witness stand with this guy coming after me. And while I'm thinking that thought, 
I had another thought. He had shared that while his ethnicity was Jewish, he really wasn't practicing any level of faith. And so he's kind of in attack mode. And this thought came to me. It was, a, it was a passage of scripture. It was about the Passover, which is a really big deal to people in Jewish faith. And I said, I, I have a question for you. And he said, well, what's that? And I said, I'm just curious. If you lived all the way back in Bible times, and you were there that night when Moses sent out the word that the way you protect your oldest child tonight is through the sacrifice of a lamb and blood being put on the doorpost of the house. I'm just curious. Would you have done it? And for the first time in the entire lunch, he went silent. And I just let him be silent. We don't have to be afraid of quiet. And he looked up at me and he said, yeah, I think I would. So my next question was, what if there was another lamb who already did that for you? Is that something you would be interested in? I had never had that thought in my entire life, but in that moment, it just felt like God whispered something to me and I had learned to listen. And the result is, is that I had a better question to ask. And he had something else to think about. And it's amazing how often that can happen. Our inability to reach people who are far from God is not because they're not listening. It's because we are not listening. I'm going to have the worship team come up. We need to learn to listen and then we need to dare to hope or dare to hope again. And in our world, that's a diminishing commodity. It's becoming rare. What does hope look like? Well, there was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Abraham. He was 100 years old and his wife was 90. And they had been told they were going to have children. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many when you were celebrating your 100th birthday, you'd have given up on that? <laughs> Some of you are half that age and you've given up on that. And Sarah was 90. You know, faith, faith believes it's possible, but hope, I'm not trying to be crass, hope makes you willing to try again. Without any of the medications available to modern man, 100 year old man and a 90 year old woman were still trying to see if they could make a baby. After all those years, decades, decades, hope. There was a, another woman. Her name was Hannah. She also was not able to have a child. And her husband had two wives. And the other wife had children. And that wife used to make fun of her. Her heart was broken. Every single month, a reminder. Nothing was happening for her. And so she went to a place of worship. And she bowed before God. And the anguish of her heart was so private and so deep, she didn't vocalize it, but her lips were moving. And the, the priest, the, the religious person in charge, accuses her of being drunk because she's just mouthing words, but no sound is coming out. She's got a, a husband that she loves but can't have a child with. She has a sister wife that, that makes fun of her all the time. And now she has a religious leader in her life accusing her of being drunk. And you know what most people would be right about then? Incredibly bitter. And here's the thing about bitter. Bitter will get, help you give up on hope and make you feel justified in doing it. But she didn't do that. She processed, she processed her bitterness, her anguish, her pain, her disappointment in prayer. And the result is God answered a prayer. 
Hope is not about denying what's true. And it's certainly not about putting our hope in systems and political parties and governmental agencies as well intended as they all may be. None of those are going to fix the deepest, greatest needs of our lives. But there is one. And your life was so important to him, he was willing to lay down his life for you. And he insists there's a purpose for every single person. He insists that there is a life that's worth living. I wonder how more attractive our conversations could be if we started like that. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, would you help our responses to include more questions, to listen, to be hopeful, to be gentle, to be respectful? And would you help our conversations as we head into a more relaxed season in our lives carry grace in a way that attract people to you? We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand this morning.